Good morning. I am so excited that all of you have chosen to be here and joined us in worship. Um, I especially want to extend a welcome to those of you who are new here. If you have any questions at all about the church, about how you can get more involved, uh, there is a new here desk right out the sanctuary doors and they can answer any questions that you might have and get you situated. I want to invite all of you to uh, to check in with us. There's a paper that looks like this in your pew backs and there's um, also in your app that you can check in and let us know that you're here because we want to know that you are here. And um, I would just want to then invite you all after you've done all that, check in first and then you can stand up and invite, uh, greet your neighbor, let them know that you're glad they're here. Good morning and welcome. I would invite you to remain standing this morning as we continue our worship series, Love Where You Live. We're going to begin today by singing hymn number 568, Christ for the World We Sing. Would you join? standing and join me in the traditional and historic Apostles' Creed, and the words will be on the side screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. (laughs) 
Would you join me now for a prayer? Holy God, we thank you for another day another day that's another gift you have given us. God, we have gathered here to worship you, to worship you who have healed our brokenness, the only one who can truly heal. You can heal relationships that we thought were gone You can heal insecurities that we have prevented us from living. God, you are the healer. God, we ask for your prayers of healing over those of us who are here and those of us who are not here. God, we ask for your mighty hand and your loving presence. God, would you help us to offer the love and the grace that you offer us? Would you help us to offer those things to those around us? And remind us that they are your children. They bear your image, God. God, we love you and we thank you for the gift of your son, for the teaching that he has shown us all the ways to live that are pleasing to you, but the ways that are best living, best for living, God, including the prayer that he taught us to pray, together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen.
Treach. You do so much for so many people. We just want to say thank you. Your generosity is a blessing to lots of people. This time, the third graders. Recently, the church handed out Bibles to 33rd graders at Treach. We were all so excited to have our very own Bible. And Pastor Daniel even encouraged our families to read it with us. Julie led a prayer and we all felt very special. All because we have a generous church that loves us. To continue to support all the ministries at Treach, simply scan the QR code or text the letters T-M-U-N-C to 45777. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Join me in saying thank you again to our singers. Wasn't that... Another little factoid you're going to want to know, one of those people actually wrote and arranged that piece. Alex, where are you? Wow. To have that amount of talent, isn't that amazing? My name is Doug Meyer, one of your associate pastors, and I'm super excited to uh, get to preach this morning because this is a really fun, engaging, challenging text. We are continuing this week with the Love Where You Live series. Have you been giving that any thought over the last couple of weeks? Are you still okay with where you live? Are you okay with the people you live with? Don't answer that right now, <laughs> especially if they're sitting by you. Let's just say yes. Let's go in with this morning with a, a strong yes. So all of this is a part of an emphasis that we have been doing to kind of reiterate uh, our clear vision statement, which is in part our effort to kind of really laser focus on who it is and what it is that we're about. We have affirmed that not just people matter, but all people matter. That means you matter. That means I matter. That means your neighbor matters. That means everybody in our area. We all what? Matter. Brokenness is healed. We're going to unpack that here in just a little bit, but I venture to guess all of us could at a certain point in our lives, I will call it walk with a limp. We all have something that we have uh, associated with, connected to either directly or indirectly that would be underscored by that phrase, brokenness is healed. And then lastly, in and through all of that, love is lived anywhere, everywhere, all the time. Are we all in? Are you all good so far? Are you with me? All right. Just, you know, Sometimes about this point is when people yawn and they start looking at their phone. And, I mean, it's not when Pastor Daniel preaches at all, but I mean, some, I, I can see a lot of y'all from where I sit over there. So um, I have kind of an affinity for this story, and let me, let me tell you why. I actually once was a, in a drama about this story. I was in about the second grade when my acting debut was made. Uh, it was during vacation Bible school, and uh, where I grew up in this little town outside of Houston, everybody went to everybody else's vacation Bible school. Did you grow up in a community like that? The mamas especially seemed to know when the Baptist church had vacation Bible school, then the Methodist church, Presbyterian church, Church of Christ, and if you could find maybe one more rogue VBS, chances are you were there with your popsicle sticks and Elmer's glue learning about Jesus. Well, so it was at our little Methodist church, and a teacher was trying to help us understand this particular story, and she had a classroom full of boys, just as life will sometimes do. That season made a bunch of boys, and if you're teaching a bunch of boys, what do you try to do? But keep them very busy, busy hands, busy hands, busy feet, busy mouth. Well, so we uh, were given the task to make a drama to reenact the story. She um, was a brave teacher, courageous teacher, but maybe didn't really think through the ramifications of asking a bunch of boys to lift up another boy who we were going to call paralyzed Joe and move him around. Well, so we all took turns, arm, leg, arm, leg, and we would, uh, the, the best part though was being the paralyzed guy, right? 
So we put out a great big uh, church table, you know, those rectangular tables that we use for everything. And one of us would lay on that, and then everybody else would move him, and we would lower him gently. And then we would do it, we'd take turns. Well, after about the fourth or fifth guy, you were tired of doing that, right? So every now and then you would maybe lower and release. <laughs> and after about two times of conks in the head and wailing kids, the drama was over. Uh, but ever since then, I've, been, I've really been fascinated with, and I've made up a whole lot of what I think this story is all about. And I probably learned it all wrong in vacation Bible school. But nonetheless, it was really a whole lot of fun. So this morning, what we're going to do is kind of begin to walk into Mark's presentation, if you would, of this guy named Jesus. And I want you to be listening to the text and then kind of what I'm going to call our warm-up text about what is it that Mark is trying to introduce to us about this guy named Jesus and why is it important of what he said and how he said it and when he said it, particularly in relationship to this healing story. So if you have uh, your Bible, good old-fashioned paper kind, if you have it on your phone, if you've downloaded the Treach app, the uh, cool little version app that you can do, down there on the bottom there's a little button you push, and it's, man, couldn't be any simpler. So let me start by saying um, Mark's an interesting character. To Mark, it was very important to present Jesus as the Son of God with the ability to speak on God's behalf in both forgiveness of sins and in healing and in changing lives. Matter of fact, over a third of all the stories Mark shares in his gospel are healing and miracle stories. So I want you to kind of put on the mind of an author this morning or a documenter. And if you are trying to make clear to your audience, whether they're reading it or hearing it then or now, what are the attributes that you really want to underscore to make sure they get it, right? What is it that you want them to get? So we're going to start. I'm going to give you what I'm going to just call appetizers. Three little texts out of Mark 1, and then we're going to jump into our main text for today. So hear the word of the Lord. Now Mark 1, 14. After, now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. All right, here we go. Jesus is on the scene and here uh, is what he's about. In uh, Mark uh, verse 21, they went up to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority. That's an important word, y'all need to remember that and not as the scribes. Who were scribes? Scribes were the uh, legal Jewish authorities at that time. They knew the good, the bad, the right, the wrong, and they were happy uh, to hold you accountable. Now, um, verse 35, in the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do. What did he come to do? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Proclaim the message. This is a test to make sure y'all are paying attention. Every now and then I'm going to do that and just make me feel good by answering the question. So uh, what did he come to do? There you go. Way to go, choir. And <laughs> I have eyes in the back of my head. And he went throughout Galilee proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. So we have this guy named Jesus who is out on the road going to different towns, very, very busy, teaching, right? And casting out demons and forgiving sins. We're going to learn about that in just a second. All right. So I'm going to read to you from Mark 2, uh, the New Revised Standard Version. And it's on that screen. Is it on that screen? Is it going to be on those screens? There you go. All right. What do you know? Isn't technology great? When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door, and he was speaking the word to them. That's a full sentence, isn't it? Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, 
and after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak in this way? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up and take your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. He stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. My friends, this is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Join me in prayer. Gracious God, we have heard your Word proclaimed. Help us this very day to have the courage to open our hearts to let it permeate and work on us. Amen. So this morning, I want to take just a couple of minutes to go back through that familiar story. You know, as often the case, we, um, we read ahead in familiar stories, don't we? Well, we kind of know what's about to happen. We know who did what. We know how the story's going to end. Um, but then sometimes when we go back and read it, our memory isn't exactly right, is it? So this morning, I want us to just kind of dig into this. I think this text has almost line for line uh, what I'll call teachable nuggets. Right off the bat, when Jesus returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. At home. Whose home? Maybe Jesus' house? Have you ever thought about that before? He was out on the road teaching, preaching, healing, and went back home. I don't know. I think as a kid growing up, I... I don't know that I ever remembered where he went. I don't know that I ever cared, but it seems like maybe that's important, that Jesus is at Jesus' house, and the word got out. The word got out. This guy that's been doing these healings, that's changing lives, that's casting out demons, he's home. Everybody seemed to find out where Jesus lived. I wonder if you lived in Jesus' neighborhood, if you knew, hey, that's Jesus' house. Y'all know that? That house right over there, that's Jesus' house. I wonder how the word the word got out, but there was such a crowd that what? The front door was blocked. Why would the author make a big deal out of saying, yeah, you couldn't even get in the front door? Well, maybe sort of probably that was the only way to get to who? To Jesus, or so they thought. Maybe also it's a, just an affirmation of, man, Jesus already had a what? Big old group of folks following him. So Jesus has a big group of folks, curious, following, hungry, seeking, in need, so many so that couldn't even get in there to see Jesus. And then what happens? Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Listen to that again. Then some people came. So some people, how many is some? I think a bunch maybe, right? A dozen? Five, eight, ten, who knows? But a group of people said, we got to go get Joe. We're going to go get Joe that we've all seen, who's always been down over here on this mat, paralyzed. And when they got there, four of them stepped forward and said, I'll take his feet, I'll take his arms. Let's get Joe. Let's pick up his mat and take him to see who? Jesus. Because word on the street is that this Jesus man can heal. Doesn't say that they're really friends. doesn't say that they knew him. doesn't say that they had any association with him at all. It just says, some people came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. They could not bring him to the feet of Jesus because, what did we find out earlier? There's a big old crowd, big old crowd, big old crowd. And so they had to carry Jesus either up a ladder or up the stairs and onto the roof of this house. They were so committed, so concerned, so passionate about getting Jesus, getting Joe to the feet of Jesus, they did what? They broke through the roof. Man, that's pretty strong faith, isn't it? That's pretty strong desire. Hey, we got him all this way, and 
Jesus has one of those really complicated roofs that we're going to have to break through the straw, we're going to have to dig through the mud. We didn't really count on that, but we're going to do it because we want to get our buddy Joe to the feet of who? Jesus. So they break through the roof. I can only imagine being in that room and the roof's falling in, what's going on? Jesus looks over and says, son, your sins are forgiven. When he saw the faith of the men carrying the paralytic, when, whose faith impressed him? The men carrying the paralytic. All right, so big action. A lot of action going on in the opening part of the story. Now, scene change, scene two. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive God? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, is that a conversation they're having out loud? No. Some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. So who could know what is somebody is questioning in their hearts? What kind of person? Maybe the Son of God? Why does this fellow speak in this way? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. So again, Mark is letting us know really clearly here Jesus' identity. And he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk? Could it be that both are equally hard to say? Listen to verse 10. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up and take your mat and go to your home. So what is it Mark has just made really crystal clear that we know about Jesus? He can forgive sins, and he also can heal. In and of that day, that was, that's not right. You're not the son of man, said the scribes. I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this before. And he went out before how many of them? So everybody in that area, I bet, knew Paralyzed Joe. It's really important for his exit to be in front of who? All of them. How did the word spread about the miracles of Jesus? From eyewitness accounts. We know this guy named Joe. He used to sit on his mat over there by the gate all the time. Now we saw Joe exit stage right right in front of how many of them? All of them. All because of who? Jesus. What's this story about today? Is that a story just about Jesus a long time ago and the things Jesus did? Or does it have any translation into our lives today? If we were to cast this this morning from the people in this room as a, uh, a vacation Bible school drama, I wonder what part you would play. Anybody in here qualified to be Jesus? We have Jesus in the house. Let's all affirm that none of us are Jesus. Sometimes we kind of think we're all that in a bag of chips, but let's just let Jesus be Jesus, okay? Are you all good with that? How many of us would be in the crowd just hanging out around the door wondering, what's going on? What's happening over there? Kind of like we do on 35 when there's an accident. We kind of look to see. We just, we don't really want to see any mayhem, but we really want to see that it's bad enough to make us, you know, an hour late. So uh, we're looking, we're wondering, we're questioning. So we might be the people who go stand in the door and look. Never, you know, we, all, we have a mix of attitudes. Is that fair to say? Curious, questioning, doubting, all of the above. Then there was a crowd of people who were so concerned to get paralyzed Joe to Jesus. 
wonder what motivated them to be that passionate. Do you think they, it doesn't say they were neighbors, friends, that they had any kind of connection, but apparently they have enough of a concern that they are what? They're willing to go through all that to get G, Joe to Jesus. Had they already experienced Jesus' healing touch? Had they seen it? Did they know about it? What, what was the motivating factor in their lives? In just a minute, Jesus is going to see in them their what? Their faith. How is it that they already had the faith in Jesus to go and, and do that? Maybe in their own lives, somebody had led them the day before when he was in Galilee. Hey, you got to come here, Jesus. Wow, I don't know. How many of us would be a foot grabber or a hand grabber? Somebody willing to go to all that effort to get up on the roof and dig through the dirt and the clay and the mud because you knew that that man's life could be what? Changed. Could it be that we are all the players in this story? Could it be that there are times when we are the crowd standing from afar? Could it be at times we're the, man, this, this is really great. I'm really excited. I want you to come but we'll let somebody else do the heavy lifting. Or maybe we are the heavy lifters. Maybe we're the friends that pick up Joe. Could it be maybe even that we are the, um, we are Joe? Could it be? You know, when you think about the phrase paralyzed, you know, we could probably go to medical terms, don't we, and think, well, they just can't move. There's a lot of different ways to be paralyzed, aren't there? Paralyzed because you're just overwhelmed with worry. Paralyzed because you're overwhelmed with task. Paralyzed because, well, the last time we did this, this happened, and now, oh, I'm going to let it be. You know, in our uh, clear vision statement, it says, brokenness is healed. When I was thinking about paralyzed and brokenness, I felt like both of those words were so big that many of us would step back and go, well, I don't have it all together, but I'm certainly not broken or paralyzed. Besides, it's just not really popular to say either one of those, right? What if I put it in different terms? What if I said, how many of us in this room today are just out of whack? You know what I mean? I don't know where we started using that phrase. That was a really popular phrase with my dad. Although every now and then he, said, he would say, I'm going to knock you out of whack. So maybe that's a different problem. <laughs> Uh, out of whack. Anybody in here overwhelmed? You might want to wait and vote until I give you the whole rundown. Uh, depleted, tired, worried, weary, worn out, wounded. Any of those starting to kind of creep in a little bit closer? Angry, heartbroken, grieving, addicted. Now let me ask again. Anybody in here Paralyzed or broken? Can I have a show of hands? Yeah, aren't we all? Really? Sort of? Yeah, we, I think we are, y'all. And I think it's okay. Matter of fact, it's a really healthy thing to say out loud. The answer to that question is yes. Yes. A strong yes. But for some reason in our world today, especially in cultures kind of like we have here in Flower Mountain, and such, it's just not always acceptable, or we're afraid it's not acceptable. Maybe that's more what it is. We're afraid to be fully known as broken people, because that's not what it looks like when you drive by our pretty house, or see our pretty car, or see our pretty kids, right? Because if I say to you, I am worn out, weary, tired, angry, so forth and so on, where does that put me in relationship to you? Am I suddenly less than? Am I suddenly somebody you don't want to have your kids around? What, it, what is it that begins to happen? And the strange thing, strange thing is we, um, we suspect that everybody else is a bit broken, but we just don't want to, them to know that, well, that we're, we're broken. You all were amazing to me years ago when I acknowledged my struggles and addiction. I was terrified 
I was, uh, I look back now on that over 10 years ago and think, I can't even believe I said those words out loud. Because forever I was convinced that if and when I did, I would, uh, a pastor with addiction issues, well, that's just not acceptable. I figured I would lose my job and that I would just like on the spot evaporate. <laughs> For some reason, I just, you know how we all make up stories in our head about, well, if I do this, then this is going to happen? The amazing miracle, my miracle, my paralysis miracle was that you said, oh, okay, yeah, we love you. Are you getting help? Yep. Man, that's so cool. And then, no more had I finished saying that, that there would be uh, murmurs, we'll call them, of me too. Me too. Me too. And it kind of was like a ripple. Different people would begin, begin to kind of encounter me or enter into my life and said, man, I'm so glad you said those words out loud because I've always wanted a place where I could say my brokenness out loud. Wouldn't it be great if we were a church that collected people who could say their brokenness out loud? There is life-giving energy in being able to say out loud, here is my struggle. And in, by the time that breath is finished, somebody else say, wow, I'm proud of you. I love you. How can we help you find Jesus? What if we had a great big old sign out front that said, broken people, welcome here. Best parking for broken people. <laughs> Bet free donuts for broken people. I think that would draw them in right there, don't you, Daniel? Hot coffee, free donuts for broken people. Maybe we would even start like a broken people section. What do you think? Like all of the, this could be for the angry, irritated, worn out, depleted parents. And there would already be coffee there. And it would just be, we would just talk softer and it'd be real like, we get it. We get it. Don't you just hold on. It's all going to be okay. And then over here would be really hard hitting, grieving with a dash of anger and, um, ooh. so we wouldn't make any big sudden noises to that crowd. Over here would be the pastors and, oh, what else would we do with y'all, right, <laughs> with us? What if we did that? What if we said, treat is a place you go and loves and are loved because we love broken people? And what if we began to esteem brokenness? That if you're broken and you share your story, man, that's great. We love you. Come on in here. Meet Jesus. And Jesus has a job for you. Just because you're broken doesn't mean you get off the hook. We're going to heal you and send you back out into the field. Because broken people make great witnesses for Jesus. Don't you think that's maybe what the paralyzed guy did? He went on the road telling the story about his life transformation. The broken people I know, you know, we have a, a, a recovery ministry here called Renew. I wish you could meet the Renew men and women. They, uh, they share the most uplifting, life-challenging, honest stories. Every day is not a home run. They come together and tell some really hard stories, but they come together, and they have each other's back, and they support each other and pray for each other. And if uh, anybody in your world is addicted to anything in any way, shape, or form, and you want to know more about it, let me know. I had a mom come up to me after the 930 service and said, Is my, can my 38-year-old son come to that? I'm like, we'll save him a seat. Absolutely. There's no can someone come. It's open to everybody in our community. So, friends, I just want to close with asking you to think about what is it you're going to do to help brokenness be healed. Are you going to name and claim your own brokenness and say it out loud? Are you going to pick up your friends and get them to the feet of Jesus? If we set out that announcement, would you know that that was Jesus' house right over there? And by the fact, we can tell the lights are on Jesus' home. What do you say we double down our efforts to gather up, to confess our own brokenness, and get people to the feet of Jesus? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? Oh, gosh, that sounded really kind of weak. Are you willing to do that? That's better. Thank you. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are eager, so they say, to get people 
to the feet of Jesus. We ourselves are broken. We ourselves need to experience love, hope, and healing. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Friends, it is because of people just like you that we continue every day to turn the lights on at Jesus' house. Your giving help makes that happen. Your giving help makes uh, salaries get paid, repairs get done, and the kingdom continue to get built. And for that, I just simply say, thanks.
invite you to stand as you're able. Please and join in our closing hymn this morning. It's found on page 428. Would you join as we sing together? We got some folks who want to come and hang out with us. Leah and Brian Roderick. See that family right up there? Their children, Zoe, Evelyn, Gwen, and CJ, are brand new members of Treats. Isn't that cool? So, I know you love them and I know you want to greet them, but don't scare them, okay? Don't just like rush all up on them all at one time, but invite them to your Sunday school class, to your life group. Help them find a special place here in the life of Treach. So, a um, cool thing happened this morning. I was supposed to send you all out to help put together love packs, but we got such an overwhelming response that all the love packs have already been made. What do you know about that? So, I do, I do have a curiosity though, Karen. So, I had said earlier that I thought the, spray, the song Love Shack should play underneath the request for love packs. How many of you know that song? Come on, Brad, you know that song. <laughs> By the B-52s? All right, just say it, I wanted to prove a point. So, uh, <laughs> let's go out and be the kind of people that bring people to meet Jesus, amen? amen. Let's go in the name of God, amen. <laughs> 